I just want to congratulate you on your book yes. about breath. I have it right here. <laughs> um, and also as a former journalist and now a breathing specialist, I'd like to say that it was absolutely amazing for me to see how skillfully you turned such a boring topic as human respiration into an adventure and exciting exploration. Uh, many members of our breathless community told me that they could not tear themselves away from your book until its last page. And I experienced the same. So no wonder it's a huge bestseller. I also would like to express my gratitude to you for raising people's awareness regarding the power of breath. Of course, it's enormously important. I often say, and I believe I told you this phrase, there is no health without healthy breathing. And your whole book elaborates on this topic. So thank you so much for offering us the current scientific data confirming many aspects of Dr. Buteka's work, which started more than 50 years ago. Um, and as you know well now that he determined that modern people don't breathe the same as our ancestors did, and also that optimal health and longevity are impossible without nasal breathing. Breathing affects everything, all aspects of our lives. And I believe that your book helps people to find the new ways to heal themselves and also improve the quality of their lives. You probably receive a lot of feedback about it, don't you? Yeah, well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And if people don't know, I interviewed Sasha, what, three, three years ago, right when I was really digging deep into this world and talked with some of her former clients who had really transformed their health through breathing. I thought, my God, why don't more people know about this? So that was really a great launching off point for me to really explore the science, the, the real science behind this further. Yeah. A few years ago when we met, I felt so sorry for you because <laughs> I felt like you would sink into that field, endless field of breathing. And it's so difficult to find your path in that huge ocean. But you did. And you well, did so uh, well. I, rem I remember you had mentioned that to me. And I said, what was she talking about? And then a few months later, I learned very clearly what you were talking about, where you could talk to two doctors at very respected institutions, and they were both saying the exact opposite thing. I said, how am I ever going to be able to objectively report on this if no one can agree on anything? But luckily, I was able to meet some real experts in the field who had spent decades in this research. They were able to take me into their labs and their lives in many ways and, and to really learn about the real science behind all of this. Yeah, you suddenly found your way. Well, it was very nice to see you, James, and now I'm going to leave um, you both for a formal interview. Thank you, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye Thank now. you very much. Thanks, Sasha. I just wanted to say, first of all, that I read your book right after it came out. I am a breathing center client myself. And I was like, oh, well, this book has been written for me. I just got into this. And suddenly there's this really um, approachable book. So I was, of course, really thrilled by it. But I'm, I'm curious, uh, just one question I have right up front is, um, are you surprised at the fact that it's become a bestseller? Did that surprise you? Yeah, especially nowadays, because we weren't even going to release it during the pandemic because distribution chains were all messed up. It's hard to find printing. Everyone was working out of the office and we were going to delay it by maybe a year until my editor and, and some of her coworkers read it and they said, no, we need to release this now. This is when people need to learn about breathing. 
right now during this epidemic, which is afflicting so many of us, our ability to breathe. So we thought, well, we'll just release it, have a soft release and see what happens and I'll pick it up next year. And it's been absolutely uh, so exciting and so grateful. It's been pretty exhausting to <laughs> try to focus on my breathing between interviews, but um, it, it's been tremendous. And especially hearing from so many dentists, so many doctors, so many pulmonologists who have said, I've been talking about this stuff for 30 years and no one's been listening. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to find the real experts in the field and tell their story. So it's these people that the clinicians who've been out on the front lines of this stuff that I think the real thanks goes to. So one thing that I noticed when I first started this journey was that the, the nasal breathing part of this whole thing seems super easy. Oh, I just put the tape on my mouth, I'm good to go. Uh, but then I started to discover that trying to breathe correctly while speaking and while eating were a whole different ball game. And I'm just curious about when you interviewed folks at the, at the breathing center, what, what did you hear about that when you talked to them about nasal breathing? Do you remember some of the, some of the things they said about their experiences with trying to do that? or even just trying to get into the whole Buteyko method itself? Well, sure, this was about three and a half years ago, but I have a very fond and, and vivid memories. Uh, Sasha was kind enough to uh, let me interview a few of her former clients and to get their stories and understand how transformative just simple breathing practices could be to their conditions, asthma, allergies, whatever, and to their lives. So specifically related to, to eating and talking, I did not, I do not recall specific lessons I learned there. I, I will have to say that it's something I've become very cognizant of because I'm having to talk now. I went from not really talking too much for a few years writing this book to, to talking all day. And notice how, how exhausted I am at the end of the day because I'm breathing through my mouth a lot, you know. I'm trying to breathe through my nose when I listen, but most of the time during interviews, I'm, I'm forced to, to breathe through my mouth, just like I did right there. So I'm cognizant of it, and I just try to, any damage that's been done, try to heal it on my off hours. I'm a huge fan of sleep tape. I use it every single night. I keep my mouth shut all the time when I'm able to, and I breathe through the nose no matter what I'm doing, if I'm running, if, even if I'm surfing, if I'm walking, because the benefits are so pronounced and there's a huge foundation of science supporting all of that. Yeah, um, I think that's the thing about uh, eating and talking that are so so funny is they're so ingrained. Those habits are so ingrained. It's just, it's a lot easier when you're like, oh, I'm going out for a run and you, you get in that habit every time you run. But yeah, I've noticed that too. It's different when you're talking with someone socially because then what I try to do is take a breath through my nose, and then I will talk for the, the length of that breath. Then you can take a pause, breathe through your nose, and naturally talk that way. But when you're on radio and interviews, if you take a pause and do that, people get so confused, and they immediately think you're done with your thought. So it depends what context you're talking in. If you're very comfortable with someone you're talking in, they won't mind that you're pausing here and there. But I've been trying to adapt that habit of breathing while I'm talking. When you first met Sasha at the Breathing Center, did, uh, were there any particular stories that really stood out where you're like, I really need to talk to that person um, to, get, to get a different perspective or even just to learn more about uh, how the Breathing Center techniques work or how the coaching works? Is there anyone uh, where right away you just felt like, yeah, I've got to get this person's input? Well, I had known about her life story because I had read her book. And I had known a bit about how she had come into this world. And it was so similar to the other stories that I had seen. So many people who discover breathing and, and learn the real power of it only found that when they really needed it, right? And they came into it through almost happenstance. She was not a breathing therapist. She was a journalist, you know, work, working in Russia. And I, I loved her story about how when Someone at, at Buteyko had, I, I don't even know if it was Constantine himself, submitted some studies when she was a journalist working at a magazine. She's yeah. like, 
what is this garbage? I don't, I don't deal with this pseudoscience. And then years later, she's like, oh my God, if I had only read that and reported on it. But I think that this is something that's so common nowadays. Everyone's so skeptical of everything, which is very good. This is a healthy thing to have. But you can't just see something and say, that doesn't fit into my worldview. I'm going to throw it away. You have to see something and look at the science, look at where the science has been done, look at the data, and then you can really make up your mind whether or not something is valid. But it's so easy for us to say, oh, that sounds crazy. That guy's an idiot. Oh, that's, you know, as a journalist, my job is to peer in very closely to all of the research and find out what's real and what's not. I have, there was no benefit for me for either believing the research of Buteco or for calling BS on it. You know, my job is to be objective and look at the studies and talk to the experts and look at the science. And I hope that's what I did in this book. Oh yeah. I think that's, that's one of the things about this book that I think it, there were a lot of balances that you had to make in terms of entertainment versus information, personal narrative versus all these other people's stories, all these mini bios. And that's the part I just think worked so well. And I mean, it's just very readable and you know it's and, and it's nice when people can get educated without it being painful. They can get some scientific information. Yeah, you know, I think that so much of what's coming out of institutions now, it's these studies are impossible to read for the layperson. And science wasn't like that. Like scientific studies are getting harder to read because they're trying to keep it in this very closed system. And my job is to try to interpret those, luckily with a lot of help from experts and to simplify it. And simple doesn't mean stupid. Mm -hmm. Simple is allowing my nephew or my mom to read this and really understand what's going on there. Because I do not have a background in, in medical science. This is the first time I've ever written about anything like this. And to a lot of degrees, I think that was a benefit because so much of it was so confusing. And I had to really get my head around it before I could convey it to other people and to other readers. Yeah, I think I read somewhere that you spent a year researching this. So you had, you, it's quite more than that. I, I spent three and a half solid years researching and writing. And before that, I was very casually picking away at it for, for years. So this, this, I had to rip up hundreds of thousands of words and start over again and start yeah. over again. Because yeah. every time I thought I had the story complete, I'd find a new study. So, yeah. Oh my God, I have to include this. Now I have to talk to this other person. So mm -hmm. this book, Sasha, I, I wasn't joking when I said at the beginning of this call, like she said, these are, you know, very rough waters. And, and I thought, oh, no problem. But uh, it, this, this book was extreme. I'm not trying to like, you know, uh, be self-aggrandizing in any way, but this book was because the subject matter is so difficult to be honest and truthful and mm -hmm. factual and that's that's what i tried to do here yeah i i was just watching the um there was a vice documentary gosh years ago on wim hof and i was just watching it last night i had some family here i'm like you have to see this and it occurred to me that even with you know as balanced as it was it still kind of comes across as incredible it's just you know as much as wim hof kept saying uh, anybody can do this here's how you do it i think it's still hard to digest the, the wonderful thing about breathing, though, and the wonderful thing about living in the age that we live in is this stuff is measurable. So with very simple instruments, I have my pulse oximeter. I use it all the time. Yeah. I have a heart rate variability monitor. I have a little EEG. So breathing is if we can measure what's happening to our bodies, we can objectively study it. This isn't someone saying, hey, I feel better. I'm ready to, to go on my way. This is looking at data and you know what happened with Wim, I was just emailing with him this, this morning. He, for years and years, people said, all of this is complete BS. No human can possibly do this. And he's the one that finally busted through and said, okay, I'm gonna sit in an ice bath for two hours. My core temperature is not gonna go down. And I'm not gonna get frostbite and I'm not gonna get hypothermia. I'm just gonna do this by breathing. People said, that's impossible. And then he does it, and it's reported on in Nature in the top scientific journals. And now people are just, huh, what else don't we know about the power of breathing? What else don't we know about our human body's potential to heal itself? Yeah. 
cracks yeah, that I find very interesting. Uh, sorry, you, you blurred out for a second there. Oh, yeah, it's um, on the topic of measurement. I got to say, that's one thing when I st stumbled across Pateco online um, and it was the control pause. I think that once that sort of sucked me in, I was like, OK, this is amazing. Because as I started to feel better and noticed that my control pause in the morning, which I think I started with like an 11 and then within a few months with a little bit of guidance, I was up to like a 25 and I felt so much better. Um, that has just been a real eye opener to me to be able to do that measurement and have that that feedback. And I think that's what a lot of people at the Breathing Center experience too. Yeah, and that that's a great example. So my father-in-law is a pulmonologist, a uh, very conservative guy, and he's been in that field for over 40 years. And I had mentioned the control pause to him. I said, what do you think about this? He said, that makes perfect sense. If your body is able to metabolize oxygen and metabolize CO2 in an efficient way, you're gonna be able to hold your breath for longer. And it's a good, it's not a perfect gauge, but it's a great general gauge of where you're at. And I was talking to Senator Bill Bradley, don't know if you, oh, you remember him. Yeah. So I was just talking to him a couple of weeks ago and every morning when he wakes up, he exhales and holds his breath. That gives him an instant gauge on his general mental health, on his general physical health, how well he slept, how well he digested the dinner last night. So he does this every single day. And I said, you know, that's, that's a thing. It's called the control pause. And he's just like, I had no idea. I've just found it's a great way of, of gauging my own health every morning. So I think wow. that so many people have come to these same conclusions. They call it different things. They recorded it in, in different ways, but it's all doing the same stuff. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's an interesting story. Um, so uh, getting back, when you mentioned uh, your father-in-law is a doctor, um, I was uh, thinking also about Dr. Packman. Do you remember interviewing him at all through of the breathing? Of course, what, talked with him numerous times, yeah. What, would you, what did you get out of talking to him? What I got out of talking to him is, um, and this was after, I talked with him after talking to uh, medical professors, pulmonologists, hematologist, uh, you know, I could go on down the list, uh, neurologist, neuroscientist, asking them all about what happens to the body in states of chronic hyperventilation. It doesn't need, even need to be major hyperventilation, just, just over breathing, what happens. And they all kind of understood it, but no one had really looked into it. And I was lucky enough to talk to Ira and we talked numerous times over, over months because this stuff, man, it was so complicated to me. Mm -hmm. But the way that he described it and his history, here's a, you know, he's an internist. Uh, he's been in the medical field for 30, 40 years. He knows what he's talking about. He was an asthmatic who healed his own asthma. So he was able to lead me down this path, show me the right studies, and to show how damaging it is for the body to be in the state of overbreathing. That it even, you know, helps, uh, it not helps, it, it hurts our bones. Uh, it can lead to increased risk of bone fractures and osteoporosis. I'm like, how does that make any sense? But then you understand how the body deals with this, you understand bicarbonate, you understand how you're leaching out all of these essential minerals. And it makes perfect sense. So he was a valuable resource and a, and a great guy who really helped me out in some big ways. Um, yeah, I found that trying to write about this myself, even uh, just a short article, I, I think I just wrote one for the Breathing Center about dexamethasone and how it works for COVID. It's a corticosteroid. And this was something that Dr. Novozhilev had said, yeah, use a corticosteroid. And then turns out they've done some studies and so forth. But I found the same phenomenon when I tried to write about it. I thought, oh, I have a pretty good science background. And I just would just go down this rabbit hole of trying to talk about the balance of CO2 and O2 and oxygen in the cells and the pH. And, and at the end, I, I would end up having these conversations with my spouse where I'm like, okay, I'm going to explain this to you. Tell me if this makes sense. And he's a nurse. And he would just be like, well, I so anyway, I, I just, I feel for it. I feel you on that topic. Yeah, and the, the key is to what, what I tried, that section of the book got a little complicated because I had to show people that this was very firmly backed by science and our understanding of medicine. But the end result is 
You overbreathe, your body's going to constantly be forced to compensate. When it's constantly being forced to compensate, it can keep you alive, can't keep you healthy. You're going to be you know, releasing a lot of essential minerals when without those in this constant state of compensation, things are going to go wrong after a while. And that is, that is clearly understood and so obvious. It's just, I, didn't, I don't see too many people talking about it. Yeah, yeah. I, that, that brings me to another thing I'm really interested in. I, another uh, interview I saw with you, you talked a little bit about your interest in holotropic breathing and finding out what, what can be discovered now with brain scans during holotropic breathing with MRIs. Um, and that kind of brings me to the sort of contradiction, I guess, between breathing less and how healthy that is and all of the great health effects from overbreathing. And I say overbreathing in terms of the, like the Wim Hof method. So the, the, what happens when you breathe and you get, you get into that state for holotropic breathing. Um, so I'm just wondering how you, well, maybe first of all, how, when you first started to reconcile those two things, how are they both healthy? Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. And, also, and, and then, yeah. And then also if you've actually done anything in terms of uh, finding out some of the science behind holotropic breathing, if there's been any, if you've, you've learned any new developments in that area, like with brain scans and so forth. So these are two things totally at odds with one another. And this is another thing that for a couple months I was like, this doesn't make any sense. We know that there's health benefits to the Wim Hof style of breathing. We know it. That's it. We, can, we can clearly measure it and we can see it. But so much of that goes against the idea of hyperventilation, all, all the detriment that you can do to your body by hyperventilating. So I spent a while with this and you know it comes down to one essential thing. When you breathe consciously, when you will your body into these other states, it's very different than breathing unconsciously. So if you have sleep apnea and you're holding your breath, you know, and you have 30 apnea events every hour, <laughs> constantly forcing this stress on your body, your adrenaline goes through the roof, your blood sugar spikes, that can lead to metabolic problems. We, we know all that. That's very bad. But when you practice breath holding consciously and you allow your threshold to see, for CO2 to naturally come up and you be comfortable with that, we know that's very therapeutic. So as far as TUMO goes or pranayamas or Sudarshan Kriya or Wim Hof method, these practices have been around for thousands of years. And what they do is they have you consciously overbreathe and get rid of all that stress so that the other 23 and a half hours of the day, you are breathing calmly through your nose in a rest and relaxed state. So instead of having this constant IV drip of stress, which so many of us have throughout the day, right? We're mm -hmm. half awake at night, we're half asleep during the day, uh, someone's gonna email me. This is stress breathing this way. You, and that's what people say, I don't want more stress. Well, it is compounding the stress to a very controlled small amount of time so that you can completely chill out. So I've noticed my breathing after doing Wim Hof's version of TUMO. I do Sudarshan Kriya. I'm a big fan of these things. The science is very clear that they have numerous benefits. I'm breathing so slowly afterwards and so calmly because I've allowed myself to enter that state of relaxation. It's the same way ultra marathoners or these people who do crazy CrossFit or extreme exercise, they're breathing 100 times a uh, minute, right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but then their resting heart rates are in the 40s. So the only way to have a low resting heart rate for a long amount of time is to breathe extremely slowly and calmly. You can't do it otherwise. So it's, it's making yourself more flexible. And that's, it's like weightlifting uh, yeah. for the lungs, for the respiratory system. Yeah, it reminds me of two things. One is tempering, is getting really cold. You're controlling this exposure to stress. Uh, the other one is like this, this therapeutic technique where you, instead of worrying all the time, you set a time at four o'clock, I'm going to worry for 10 minutes. It's the most hilarious thing if you've ever tried it, where you, you sit down and you're like, you can't think of a darn thing to worry about. And, uh, it, and it works. It, it relieves the pressure.
this this is the exact same thing. And I know a lot of this butts against a lot of the Buteco philosophy, but I think you can have these different tools in the toolbox. I would not suggest someone with asthma go and do holotropic breath work. That's a bad idea. But yeah. someone with autoimmune problems, we know that Wim Hof's version of Tumo and cold therapy can have a tremendous effect on, on autoimmune problems. And that's, that's been clearly demonstrated. So I don't ha think that breathing and the science of breathing has to be one thing or the other. I think it depends on what you want out of it. And you have to understand that there are benefits to these different modes. Yeah, and I think that, um, and I, I, I want to get back focused on Buteco for sure, but I think that for me, I, I find that, and I think this is true for many people, you know, holding two contradictory ideas in your head at the same time is painful and difficult, and it's better, it's easier to just think of one. And I think that I saw an interview with you also where um, you had said, the person asked you, well, if you had to boil it down in a nutshell, what's the thing you would tell people about breathing? And I, I believe your response, not to put words in your mouth, was breathe less. Absolutely. That, that's, breathe, yeah. breathe slow, breathe less. You yeah. can't say that. And then I usually put in a caveat for someone with an underlying health condition who is not getting enough oxygen. No, don't, don't, don't breathe less. You, you need that, that O2, you need to breathe properly. But for the vast majority of us, the vast majority of us are breathing too much. You are going to be able to get more by breathing less. Patrick McEwen, uh, well-known Buteco, therapist, breathing expert, showed me this incredible chart where he said people who breathe 20 breaths a minute at six, six liters a minute, they have a respiratory efficiency of about 50%. So 50% of the air actually makes it into lungs because they're just bringing air into here and, and throwing it out, right? If you increase that to 12 breaths per minute, that increases about 75% efficiency, huge. And then if you increase it six breaths per minute, which in my opinion, five to six breaths per minute, that's, that's the real magic amount to be breathing. That respiratory efficiency goes up about 80%, you know, 85%. Yeah. So that's, that's huge. Breathe, breathe slow, breathe less. Use that air that comes into your body most efficiently. Uh, don't, don't just bring it in to throw it out. One of the things with the Pateco method that I've found is that it's sort of subtle. It's, it's got this kind of, you can watch a movie like Iceman and see, and see Wim Hof, and it's, it's got this drama to it. And I think Dr. Bateko's life had a lot of drama to it, for sure. And certainly Sasha's story, too, is an amazing story. But when it comes to the method itself, it's almost like, well, you're just not doing very much. And so there's a lot of, you know, coaching that has to go into that. And I guess, um, so I guess my question is just, when you wrote the chapter less, um, what were some of the challenges you had and how did you even get to writing that chapter really? Was that because you heard Boteco's story or Sasha's story? It was because of so many different things. Um, and I wasn't just looking on that chapter. It's not just about Boteco. It's about this whole idea that breathing less will give you more. And so that's usually associated with, with Buteco because he's, he's well known now. But this thinking has been around for thousands of years. And I think Buteco would, would support this, that what he was taking, these are ancient methods. If you look at the Chinese Tao, there's what, seven books of the Chinese Tao focused entirely on breathing. Some of them are 2000 years old. They talk about breath holds all the time. If you look at Pranayama, Breaking, also known as breath holding, is talked about all the time. An early translation for the word pranayama meant transinduced by holding your breath. So, so this stuff has been around for a long time. People have been seeing the benefits, a lot of empirical observational studies, but it wasn't until really the 20th century that we were able to clearly measure what was happening to the brain and body when we're able to breathe more efficiently. And this is something Sasha told me early, which really resonated with me. She's like, it's not really about breathing less, even though that's what we need to train ourselves to do. It's about breathing normally. This is normal breathing, but we are so off on the other end. We're so breathing too much that for the vast majority of us, normal means scaling it way down. And I think that that is, the, the real nut of this whole thing, that chapter could have been called 
breathe normally, but the way to communicate this to so many of us is breathing less is actually normal. How we're breathing now is way out of whack. There's something that's always intrigued me about Bateco is it's so powerful. It's such a great technique. It's got so much science behind it, but it's almost got a little bit of a PR problem. And I've never really been able to, and, and again, it's got, it's got the breathing center. It's got Sasha, which is, you know, great, a great story, a great um, ambassador for Bateco. And yet there's this kind of, it's hard to make it, um, I don't know. It's just, it's hard to make it intriguing to a lot of people, I think. <laughs> So uh, I, I think if, if you're talking about Buteco and PR problem, you know, some of that could be due to some therapists who may not be really qualified or the best spokespeople for, for Buteco. And, and so maybe the wrong information has gotten out by the wrong, by the wrong people. That's part of it. But I, I think it comes down to, you made a very good point. Like Wim Hof, his breathing, it's, it's flashy, you know, and he's the first to say that. He's, he's the guru. He's like, come on, everybody, breathe. I've, he's a great dude. Um, but but to, to see that, and then you look at Buteco, and it's someone who's, who's holding their breath. It's not as flashy. But go into the stories of the people who have used breathing less techniques, who had had chronic allergies, who had had chronic asthma, other respiratory issues, and see how their lives have been transformed. That is to me, that's where the story is. You know, nature isn't always flashy. As Albert Svent Georgi said, uh, nature is simple yet subtle. And I would apply that to Buteco and breathing less methods that there's, there's a real grace and beauty to something being extremely quiet. You know, there's a power in that and not having to go out and blast it out all over the place but to let your body naturally do what it wants to do. And that's obviously what these breathing less practices are showing people how to do. That's why they're able to, to heal themselves of so many chronic issues. One thing that I do find interesting about Botego is it seems like in Australia, in New Zealand, in the UK, those probably just because the, the medical systems uh, glommed onto Botego at some point, uh, it does seem to be get a little bit more coverage and a little bit more press. And, and I do wonder if maybe that's part of it. And I, I also appreciate what you said about there are practitioners out there who aren't um, always above board or don't communicate well, and it's a complex thing to learn. Um, I'm wondering if you, in talking with any of the Breathing Center folks uh, that you interviewed years ago, if you talked to anybody where you felt like they reported, oh, I had a lot of trouble, or it seemed dangerous to me, or I had to stop for this or that. Or... Well, I think that people come into this and they're apprehensive. If they're in real trouble, then holding, telling someone to hold their breath, which is exactly something that they associate with an asthma attack or a panic attack, that's a big ask. But to allow them to understand where their panic and anxiety is coming from, allowing them to understand that their need to breathe is not dictated by oxygen. They're not mm -hmm. deprived of oxygen, which is our greatest fear as a species is that we won't be able to breathe. It's that it's an increase of CO2 and that by increasing that CO2 and bringing it back into balance, you can actually stimulate so many benefits to the body. I mean, just a few minutes of slow breathing, you can feel your cold fingers heat up. You can feel your toes heat up. Everything starts coming online. You feel, and this stuff is easily measurable. I mean, I can measure it right now. You just imagine after a couple minutes of breathing that way, you feel those benefits. What's going to happen after a couple of days? What's going to happen after a couple of weeks? Well, we're seeing it. I can't tell you how many people have been writing me who have said like, I've started breathing this certain way. I've gone to Buteco. I'm trying Papworth. I'm, I'm changing my breathing habits. I'm breathing less. And they're showing tremendous improvements. Even ultra marathoners, you know, even very fit people who you think this is the fittest person on the planet. They're showing improvements in performance because you're allowing the body to operate more efficiently. You're not overworking it all the time. You know, you can think of 
of a car at a stop sign, would you want to just rev the motor at a stop sign when you're idle? No. <laughs> you want that car to be working as efficiently as it can to preserve fuel, to stop a lot of wear and tear on the body. And that's exactly what breathing in line with your metabolic needs does. And that's exactly what happens when you start, when you go from being an overbreather to breathing normally again. Do you find that when um, friends and family ask you about breathing techniques, which I'm guessing happens, happens occasionally, do you find yourself having to go, okay, I'm not, I'm only going to talk a little bit about this. I'm going to just, just give them a little information and give them some resources. Well, I'm in a good position where I'm as a reporter, I'm not a breathing therapist, not a doctor. I'm not going to put on the, you know, breathing therapist hat and go tell everyone, oh, okay, everybody breathe. That's other people are really good at that. And that's not my job. My job is to look objectively at what these people are saying and the science behind it and parlay that to, to the public. So having said that with that big caveat, yeah, I get asked it every day. And I try to explain to them just because I've written this book, I'm not the best breather in the world. I'm sure there's a lot of Buteco instructors who are looking at me right now and saying he's breathing through his mouth, but I still have a long way to go. But I think the, the first step is awareness. You start with, I'm aware of my breathing all the time and I'm able to really harness that. And Luckily, so many of these practices, they're pretty simple. They don't, it's not asking someone to change their diet to go keto for, for three months or paleo or vegan. It's asking you to take control of your breathing. And just as you had found, I mean, I've, I've seen people who've never ever thought about breathing and just a few breaths of breathing deep into their diaphragm and out again, very slow. And it, they look like there's some new animal loosened in their chest because they haven't felt that before. And then you see the effects and how, how relaxed they are. And why would you want to go back to the way you were breathing, the inefficient ways you were breathing before? It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, it's, that, it's a great explanation. It's the proof is in the pudding. And, and also with diet, you know, I think as we've all probably experienced, it takes weeks to months to see a lot of progress. A lot of times with breathing, you're, it's right there. You can get your pulse oximeter out or whatever, you're just feeling better right away, for, for sure. sure. And you can, you can measure your sleep as well. That, that was something that during the Stanford experiment was absolutely shocking to me. I worked with the chief of rhinology research at Stanford, big nose guy, you didn't need to convince him of the power of nasal breathing. He's, he's one of the top experts in the world. He pens something like 30 papers a year, this guy's just a machine. So he knew it. Um, and when we plugged our noses and just breathed out of our mouths for, for 10 days and measured it, you know, and that was the whole point is like, well, how damaging is this? Oh, we, we saw within a few hours, it is just so damaging. And to think that 25 to 50% of the population is habitually mouth breathing. So I, I think the best health improvement, the best advice you could give the population right now, easy trick, stop breathing out of your mouth. You start with that, only breathe out of your nose. And I think you would see huge improvements in health across the board. Yeah, I think, I wish we could um, somehow train all doctors and, and maybe all nurses too, to take up that expression of Dr. Botego's that you should, um, let's see, breathe through your mouth as often as you eat through your nose, I think it is. Because <laughs> that's, that's a winner, it's a great saying. It's a little too long for a bumper sticker, but if we could just get doctors to convey that, I mean, it'd just be a huge improvement for everybody. You notice like when you go in for a checkup with, with your doctor, this is something I mentioned at the beginning of the book, they're looking at your blood pressure. They're asking you if you have any headaches, if you have sleeping problems, or if you have anxiety, but they're never looking at your breathing. And how we breathe affects all of those things. It even affects metabolic function. It affects GERD. I mean, on and on, it affects inflammation immune function, nervous system. I mean, I could go on and on. So I really think that this should be a part of, doctors are so completely overworked here. They already have too much to do, but I think by looking at someone's breathing and having some understanding of how just adopting simple breathing habits can really help so many conditions, I think that that would be a, a good place to start. And also maybe give some people some lip tape and say, 
zip the lip, breathe through your nose, and come, come back to me next month. Tell me how you feel. I know. I feel like you could just do a series of workshops just on the tape, literally. How to use it, what kind to get, what not to do. What? But that's, that's already happening. I mean, where I heard about tape and where I really started believing it was at Stanford. And this is a top research institution in the world, breathing therapist named, she's a doctor of speech language pathology named uh, Ann Kearney. And she had had chronic nasal problems, habitual mouth breather, was slated for surgery. She said, wait, that doesn't sound right. I'm going to try to heal this myself. So she gives all of her patients sleep tape. And she's trying to boot up a huge study of 200 people looking at sleep apnea and snoring and, and sleep tape. But again, oh, yeah. as I mentioned earlier, I've received literally hundreds of emails from people saying that just putting a little piece of tape on their mouth at night, I'm not talking about a fat strip, you know, just a teeny piece to, piece to train the jaw shut, tremendous improvements in their sleep. And this is, this is free stuff, everyone. And uh, if a third of your life, you're just breathing through your nose, that's a great place to start. It's so, so simple. Again, it's not asking people to do too much. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. You know, here's, here's my sleep tape. I just keep it, keep it by the station here. Uh, first few days, I hated it. I said, there's no way I can do this because for decades, I went to sleep with a huge glass of water by the side of my bed, dry mouth. Every couple hours, I'd wake up. And I thought, this is, this is normal. Because I'd ask people, like, oh, yeah, I do the same thing. Then you sleep tape, and you're like, what the hell have I been doing for, de for decades? <sighs> Sleeping like this, you know, causes periodontal disease, cavities, on and on and on. We know all that. And such a simple thing. I knew uh, Buteka was a big fan of the whole tennis balls on the, on, on the back to keep oh, you yeah. from sleeping off, off the back. That's great too. Um, no problem with that. But I think just, just starting with nasal breathing at night is, is a wonderful foundation upon which to build. If you were teaching, a, let's say a class of, you know, just a one hour class of college students or high school students about breathing, um, what do you think, what points do you think you would emphasize to them? You know, being young enough to kind of change their ways. I would say don't underestimate the power of breathing, even though it's unconscious, even though we don't have to think about it. When we take conscious control of this, we can start to control so many different systems in our bodies and we can really bring them back into balance. And then I would start with exactly what we were talking about. And, you know, the middle of the book was just these simple pragmatic things that everyone could benefit from. Breathe through your nose, breathe slowly, breathe less and have a full exhale. So a lot of people will <gasps> pack air on air on air. And I think you really want to have that full complete exhale because breathing isn't just a biochemical process. It's not just about exchanging carbon dioxide for oxygen, even though that's most of what we hear. Breathing is a biomechanical process. Engaging this diaphragm sends signals back to the brain to relax. So every time we breathe in, we're allowing our diaphragm to massage these organs, release more lymph fluid, so release more toxins. So you have to think about the most important muscle on the entire body is the diaphragm. And by engaging that in a healthy way, you're going to really be able to put yourself into a place of balance where your body will be naturally able to heal itself. Well, I really appreciate uh, taking time today to talk to us and congratulations on the book. It's amazing. I hope you continue to do many interviews and with, with very little uh, mouth breathing while you're talking. Really appreciate it. I'm going to start working on that right now. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. Okay. Take care, James.